Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this, this segment, folks, of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. If you notice in the in the camera, you know, is that the voters pamphlet, Oregon primary election, May 20, 2014. Well, hey, folks, this is, this is the Bible. This is the Bible, the voters pamphlet here. I tell you, when you start thinking about anything else that we have, I tell you, there might be some exceptions. We're going to go into that. But what we're going to do, first thing we're going to do, we're going to wish all you mothers out there happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. And to my wife, Norma, happy Mother's Day, dear. And to anybody and everybody who... Who's a mother by Ted? We want to say Happy Mother's Day. And we want to say Happy Mother's Day to Delinda. First, we want to get in a political thing at this point in time. We're going to say Happy Mother's Day to you, Delinda. Thank you. I appreciate okay, it. Okay, fine. Well, we're going to do this segment, uh, after two segments. We've got two two women who are who are basically running for office, but they're really solid leaders, you know, in, in all due respect in their ranks, besides being solid mothers, uh, solid, solid wife, parents. I mean, just I mean, just 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 unique kinds of folks, and um, the reason why I'm I'm making that point is that uh, it's so important that when we when looking for leadership among our ranks, we have to get the, the a certain quality of a person uh, to represent, if you will, us, because uh, because often we tend to end up with politicians, and that's really not what we're looking for. You know what I'm saying? Uh, because we're talking about representing the people, because it is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. In most cases, politicians represent government, and they, they just don't emphasize the people portion of that. And so I, I just want to make that point very clear, because that's really what the show is going to be all about today. Again, it's, like I said, it's Mother's Day. Again, happy Mother's Day to everybody. All right. Delinda, welcome again. Thank you. All your voters digest. And... Uh, it's my understanding you're going to be running for uh, running for Congress. Yes, sir. And uh, and that's going to be basically in, in in district number one, first district number one again. Delgado, I, I still mention the name. Delinda. Delinda. Delgado, Delgado Morgan. Right there we go. She and basically she's run, she's a candidate for, for representative in Congress, the first district. Okay, and she's a Republican, right? Yes, I am. Okay, good. A now, proud Republican. You know, I noticed all of the endorsements and, and et cetera. And as I looked at all of the endorsements, it doesn't really reflect who you are. No, I, I'm just. Uh, yeah. My idea of a, an endorsement yeah. is the 109,699 people who voted for me in 2012. Yeah, yeah. I look for individual endorsements. On my webpage, I am putting up testimonials. Mm -hmm. as endorsements. But they Be interviewed you. I'm, I'm not trying to cut you off with it. But folks interviewed you, right? Folks did. I, yeah. uh, the media, I have, various mediums interviewed you? I have a friend that said the reason I earned the 109,000 votes plus was because I shook that many hands. My idea is to get out there and let people know who I really am. Mm -hmm. But you were And interviewed. listen to them. But at the same time, you were interviewed by folks. You did. You did. You open yourself up for various interviews. I right? did open myself up, but very few media agencies want to have anyone on that isn't someone that they support. Hmm. Many, hmm. many medias are like that. It, for instance, um, there's been a big scuffle about the uh, Willamette Week and what happened in there with someone, you know, walking that out. That was one of the interviewers, right? Yes. And in 2012, they interviewed me. And my interview event went very well. But in the endorsement section, they decided not to write anything up. That was their choice. So this go around, Willamette Week did endorse me. But I wouldn't call it a friendly endorsement. It was almost as if they were forced to endorse me. It wasn't... Um, it wasn't very positive the way I looked. No, well, I mean that's the local here, local that's Portland local, metro yes. area. Uh, just briefly, what, what's what's your what's what's the what's, what's your district look like? What, what my district's outline? my district's very diverse okay. and very rural. It okay. goes from Astoria to Portland, so okay. it's Washington County is my biggest county. Mm -hmm. Second largest is Yamhill County. Mm -hmm. Third largest is Columbia County. Fourth is 12 precincts in Multnomah County, which is southwest Portland area. Okay. 
okay. and Clatsop County, which includes Astoria. Okay. Well, let's, let, I tell you what, we're going we're gonna to interview you. Thank uh, you. Yeah, Oregon Voters Digest, I, we're going to interview you. And the way we're going to do this is that, uh, first off, let's talk a little bit about Delinda in terms of her background. You know, what, what brings you up here right now today? Give us give a little bit about your background, your educational background, uh, you know, just basically how you've come up, uh, you know. From it's Mother's Day, and I also want to wish all the mothers out there a wonderful Mother's Day. Okay. I had the best mother in the world, Marie. My mother is fourth generation uh, founder of the Western Territory. The Olivas, and my mother's maiden name was Olivas, founded the missions. They built the missions coming up through California from San Diego up to Santa Barbara. They, mm -hmm. they founded the San Buenaventura mission. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, my grandfather, great-great-grandfather and grandmother had 22 children, mm -hmm. so they helped populate California. Mm -hmm. One of my great aunts moved to Oregon to help populate Oregon. Sarita Olivas, who married an Italian man, and after he served on a naval ship in the Civil War, um, gained citizenship. So they named him Peterson. Okay. So I think his first name probably was Peter. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they named him Peterson. And they moved to Oregon. So I would love to get in contact with all the Olivas Peterson uh, family that I have up here. Okay. Um, what about Delinda? I want to know about Delinda. I am a very focused business person. Growing up, we had a family business. It was a construction company that uh, went to the highest rank of construction companies. We were awarded... Personally, from President Ronald Reagan, Contractor of the Year in 1980. And where was this? Where was this? When? It was actually at the Sheridan Hotel no, in Washington, D.C. No, but I'm just saying, where, where did you start? Where was the business? The business was Delgado and Sons, okay. Incorporated. You started it here in We Oregon. started in Southern California. In Southern California. Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. What kind of construction business was it? It was a Class A construction company, so we built military um, facilities, Okay. Um, we built airways, taxiways, runways, roads. Uh, I built a combat ordnance loading area. Uh, we resurfaced the heliport at Tustin Marine Corps Air Station, where I met my husband. Mm -hmm. And he was flying helicopters. And there were several things that came up during that project, many projects. Mm -hmm. So the colonels, majors, and sometimes generals would be in a meeting. There could be 30 men in there, and they would say, no, we want it done this way. And I would say it can't be done that way because if you do not take away the unsuitable and compact it correctly, if a helicopter happens to not land directly on the pad, it could sink into that. And you don't want to lose a million dollar machine because you're not doing your construction correctly. So you were running a crew. So I was running the project, yes. And dad basically was a, he was a, he was a, he was a general, so to speak. Well, no, there were the colonels and generals and majors. But I mean, of the business, of the business. Who was running the business? My father owned the business. Okay, good. Okay. But we actually had a tragedy at that time, and my youngest brother passed away. Okay. So my mother and father took a hiatus to, uh, to find happiness. To and, and now you're running the business. Well, my brother and I, yes. You and your brother. My other brother and I in were California. running the business, yes. In California, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're basically all over the place. Yes, and uh, in 1986, because we had one contractor of the year for four years in a row, we decided that's it. Let someone else have a chance. Okay. The awards do mean a lot, but you can only win so many awards mm -hmm. before it becomes um, someone else's turn. Mm -hmm. And we were willing to give that hat over to someone else. During that particular time, what sort of a crew were you running? I mean, what, what about Every numbers? single kind. What about numbers? We had, uh, at times, we had seven subcontractors, hundreds okay. of people. You're I have organizing. signed thousands of checks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there isn't anything I've not done. Mm -hmm. I have run a asphalt paver myself. So what are you doing? Okay, we're going from California, now we're here in Portland. Well, Oregon, what happened right? was when I married my wonderful husband, Okay. He's from Dayton, Oregon, okay. which is near uh, Newburgh, McMinnville, okay. um, and he wanted to move back to Oregon. He thought that would be the healthiest thing for our children. Okay. So I gave up the multi-million dollar contractor of the year, big construction life, 
in Oregon to raise my family because I want I thought being to come at home, to Oregon to come to Oregon to come to Oregon okay and I thought being at home with my children was the gift my mother gave me yeah, it was a gift yeah, I wanted okay. to give to my sons okay. okay so now you're in Oregon so I'm so, in Oregon so what are you doing now so we decided to start a few small businesses okay. we already had one business going which was a clothing business mm -hmm. it was making the best worsted wool hunting clothing in the world mm -hmm. and uh, that um, business was based in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and my husband would go back and work back there. We helped them with all of the setup and the um, sales. We went to a lot of shows like Safari Club International. Kind of a family business now. The kids were taking along to it at the same time. Yes, and we sold clothing to people like uh, President H.W. Bush, okay. General Schwarzkopf, which I do have a picture with General Schwarzkopf, and uh, I loved him. He was a wonderful man. Many, many famous people owned our clothing. Um, we also were farmers. We started a farming business. Um, we also started a martial arts school so that mm -hmm. we could be with our children. Our children were never free and loose. Mm -hmm. If they weren't at school and they weren't they in sports, that. they were with us. Mm -hmm. And they were some of our first instructors at our martial arts school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we had that school commercially for 17 years. Mm -hmm. And really appreciated having a family here business Oregon, with our family Oregon. in McMinnville, Oregon. McMinnville. Oh, good, 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 good. It's good. Oregon Family Karate. Mm -hmm. Many families have thanked us for the mm -hmm. um, things that their children gained by mm -hmm. being martial arts students. We have mm -hmm. about 33 black belts right now. Tell me, when did you when did you start getting an interest in your community in terms of getting involved? From day in one, as a matter of fact. Um, after I moved here, uh, we had, because of an, another tragedy, uh, we actually had a golf tournament that we raised money for cancer research for eight years, over $100,000 mm -hmm. to Loma Linda University Medical Center Cancer Research. Mm -hmm. And I was the fundraiser director. So we would take our whole family home, raise money during the golf tournament, donate the money, and then uh, come back. We'd do that every year. Um, I have a friend whose husband passed away. He was the most winningest coach in um, Oregon. It was Dewey Sullivan, Dayton, Oregon, where my husband went to high school. And when he got a brain tumor and passed away, his wife was about the same age as my mother. And they had been married. My parents are married 62 years. They mm -hmm. were about the mm -hmm. same mm -hmm. place. She didn't know what she wanted to do. I said, why don't you write a book? Why don't you write a book about all the wonderful things that have happened to you? Have a golf tournament. Do something. Get a fundraiser going for the kids in your community. And she did. And when she wrote the book, A Barefoot Boy from Oklahoma, mm -hmm. um, she mentioned me in her book saying that I encouraged her and inspired her to um, write a book. Raising money and doing things for underprivileged children and people who need help is what I love to do. Mm. I love to help people. I think that that is everyone's... Uh, I'm Catholic. So last Sunday, I was just godmother to a 16-year-old boy who wanted to confirm his religion. I think that that is every person's opportunity when they can help a person or a group of people mm -hmm. to achieve the next level, mm -hmm. to know their value. Okay. Now that you, you've gotten all this exposure, experience, and contractor, and, and you, met, you met Lance, and you moved to Oregon, you've gotten all these business, and as a result of that, you're out there in the community, et cetera, et cetera. Now you're getting ready to jump into politics. When, it, when, did, you first, when, when did you first entertain this idea of getting it, and why? And, you know, it's a great story because um, I actually was inspired doing charity work. I was actually donating fabric to a organization that makes quilts and for foster children who have never received anything. They make quilts anonymously. So I don't want to give you their name because it's very important for them to stay anonymous. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But when I was there, uh, the question came up, why doesn't someone like you run? Someone that actually cares about the people, someone that's actually doing the work okay. that's called for in our community. Okay. And I thought, you know, my children are grown. My children are in college. They're well on their way to success. Why don't I run? Because I think that the people of run District for what? 1. What did, what did you want you to know? Congressional District 1. Number 1. So it was during the special election. Okay. And 
my children being in college, I have the time, I have the business background, the mm-hmm. education, and the heart. Mm-hmm. So why don't I run? So what were the issues during that particular time when you first, that you were They're addressing? They're about the same as they are now. Wh- which are? With, which are jobs, the economy, and freedom, and getting government out of our lives. Okay. The individual hires the federal government. W- they work for us. And the way things are being twisted and the way they're taking over our economy, our transportation, our health care, now our doctors, it was too much. I, I, they need to be held back. They need to be held in check. They need to know what their job is. And someone needs to go to Congress and remind them. Okay, so, what, what, so this is all part of what Delinda is going to do. Would yes. you expand on that then? Okay, expanding on that. Let's take it for instance. Let's take it for instance. Uh, the whole issue of health care, you know, there's been a big roar in regards yes. to health care. And people are trying to basically come up with a solution to that. Yes. And uh, then the, 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 the elected president of the United States, i.e., uh, yes. basically uh, said, well, we're going to come up with this particular program, okay? Well, I think, I think what... So what do, you, what do you think? I think what Obamacare, the ACA, you know, how, whatever you want to call it, I think what they're doing is they're telling you what you're going to achieve. They're going to tell you at 69 years old, you're too old for these procedures. We're going to tell you. Even people on Medicare know that there's things that they can't even pay for personally because they're going to tell you what you get. That's wrong. Number one. The Tenth Amendment needs to be held sacred. Which is? Which is, if something isn't given to the federal government, clearly in the U.S. Constitution, it belongs to the states and therefore to the individuals. Okay. So health care is an issue that's a state's issue. It's up to the states what they decide will be available in their states. It shouldn't be the federal government saying they cannot compete against across state lines. Tort reform has gone over very well in Texas. It's something that's given their doctors and their medical system opportunity. We should have tort reform in our state. Also, the VA is allowed to get any pharmaceutical um, purchasing bids from any individual companies. Why can't individual healthcare companies do that? And why does the federal government prohibit interstate commerce with health care institutions. That's wrong. That's one of the federal government's jobs is to make sure that all states are treated equally. Are they treated equally when only certain companies can compete in your state? No. So federal government is dysfunctional and they are not following the Constitution the way it was written. And the way it was written was for we the people, we're the boss. Mm -hmm. So we're the ones that decide. And let's say that our state has gone off way off the left deep end and they want to put all these restrictions on our state. It's up to us to vote the people in that are going to make it right and give every individual the opportunity to choose what they want. Okay. Now, as you know, it's all about numbers when you get in Congress. Yes, it is. If you can't garner the numbers, you can't get the issues passed. Therefore, you can't bring the bacon home. Well, that's the other objection so that I have. So I, what do you think? I have a huge objection to that. And it, it shouldn't be about bringing the bacon home. Okay. It should be about keeping the bacon here. Oh, keeping the bacon here. That's right. So your form of government would be what? My form of government would be to take federal government as much out of the equation as possible, okay? So in other words, instead of our dollars going there for federal tax, for transportation, filtering it through all the federal agencies, why don't we keep those federal dollars here? Why don't we decide our transportation issues and what's good for Oregon? I live next to the county line, Washington County and Yamhill County. Mm There is no difference when I drive on the road and I cross the county line. Why? Because that's the way it should be. Washington County maintains the road up until the county line. Yamhill County maintains it up to the Washington County line. You don't really see the difference. You don't notice it. 
it should be that way with states also. So the big issue right now is the Columbia River crossing. Mm -hmm. And in 2012, when I ran, my opponent, that is the incumbent, mm -hmm. decided that that Columbia River crossing was going to pass. And they've invested a third of a billion dollars or more mm -hmm. trying to push that issue without one shovel in the ground. She doesn't know transportation. That's not the way it should operate. You shouldn't try to be shoving the light rail down the throats of Washington. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do, as far as the bridges go, is we need to figure out how many dollars we have to spend on it and how many dollars Washington has to spend on it. And then we need to address where exactly would be the best place to put that bridge. Mm -hmm. Do we need a deep port at Savi Island so that the truck traffic can be taken off all the other freeways? go through Savi Island and across would be less congestion. We would be solving a lot of problems just taking that traffic off. Mm -hmm. You could build three bridges for probably 20% of the cost of what they're talking for one bridge to force the light rail that the bridge would be too low. Mm -hmm. okay. So even though that has been put the kibosh, yeah. that has been, it has taken the people standing up and speaking up mm -hmm. for that to be stopped okay let's get there's several other issues i mean throw out on the table this whole new marijuana issue now they, they, <laughs> they've been pushing that piece down there in fact there's a name in person here that's pushing it uh, to my Earl Blumenauer, who's in the i think the third congressional fifth congressional district i think one with the other but anyway but the bottom line what do you think about that what, what should we do in that i think it's How none of his business i think it's none of federal government's business you know they're sticking their big nose in everybody's business and that has got to stop the marijuana issue, it's a drug. Let's face it, it is a drug. If the state of Colorado and the state of Washington gain major problems because of this, we need to analyze what's going on. My sheriff put it best, Sheriff Crabtree in Yamhill County. He said, we don't need it in our county. We don't need to have to take care of that issue. So if the county of Yamhill decides they don't want the marijuana clinics and they don't want it legalized in their county, I think mm -hmm. they should be able to decide. Mm -hmm. So I think it should be taken down to a, a county level if that is the case. But anyone that wanted that drug could drive across the border right now and get it over in wa the state of Washington okay. if they okay. wanted to. Okay. okay. But is that a place that we should be looking for funds? Is that really something that we should be talking about? Or is that a social issue? Mm -hmm. Is that something that the voters could decide what they want or not? Okay, good point. Well, that, and there's, there's these other volatile issues. You, you're running in a very liberal kind of environment at times. I am. You know what I'm saying? But it's always good to talk about their issues, right? It is. In terms of asking you a solution. Now, the whole issue of the gay marriage thing, that's another big issue here yes, within, within this state, even in your area, especially yes. in the Port Neuf area. What do you think about that? That is an interesting question. It is? Okay. And what I want to begin with is I'm Catholic. Okay. Okay. So marriage to me is sacred. Mm -hmm. It's a sacrament. There's seven sacraments. The most important of all these sacraments are baptism, confirmation, and marriage. Mm -hmm. Once you're confirmed a Catholic, no one can ever take that away from you. You can go to any church, you can go anywhere, but you're confirmed Catholic, you'll always be a Catholic. Okay. Why don't homosexuals want to be confirmed homosexual? Why don't they want to be baptized homosexual? Why don't they ask for other sacraments? Why is it just marriage? Okay. It's between a man and a woman. That is what God created. Ha know. Having said that, okay. having said that, any, any two people can go to the courthouse and get a power of attorney. Yeah. And they can give that other person every right yeah, they, they have, have us, yeah. with the power of attorney. Mm -hmm. Why don't they fight for that? Why don't they go and say, I have a power of attorney with my partner or with my whatever? They can do whatever they want. Why are they always trying to take something from us? Good point. Good Invent point. their own name. Another one Another one that's kind of like a little heavy aspect is the whole issue of immigration peace aspect of it. Yes. What's, what's your feel about that? That's a good question. Yeah. Me being Spanish, yes. and I talked to someone about this the other day. Me being Spanish, 
and Mexican. Right. Mexican on my dad's side, Spaniard on my mother's side. I'm very proud of my heritage. Why don't people come up and say, do you know that the Spanish and the Mexican culture founded the Western territory of the United States? Do you know that this is the face? This is what, who the people are who fought to draw that line in the sand and make that border, who fought for your rights, who fought off the Spanish government, who fought off the Mexican government, who brought the missions and the Catholic religion into the United States. Why don't they talk about the good things that the Spanish and Hispanic have done? That would open the hearts and minds of all the business people, all the businessmen that have been here for generations. Why don't we start with that? before everyone's talking about illegal, illegal, illegal. What percentage of that? Shouldn't we be talking about the good things that the Hispanic community has done? And then I do want to say, no amnesty, okay? No citizenship for free. Let's enforce the laws we have after we enforce our border, okay? Secure our border. Three things, secure our borders, secure our borders, secure our border. Mm -hmm. Enforce the laws we have. And then have a plan for the 12 million people here. Have a good plan. My plan is community service for earning the right to work. Earning the right to work through community service. People in Habitat for Humanity, they work 500 hours and they earn a house. Why can't we have a program like that with the Sheriff's Department and Immigration Department? Why can't we start a pilot program and see how it works when they're doing community service and helping our communities, painting churches, helping the elderly, having a food kitchen, whatever it is, and they earn through hours a work permit so that they're allowed to work here and raise their head up high and say, I earned the right to work here. I have earned it. When you're talking about all these other issues or you know, people thinking they're giving someone something, you're not. They're not giving the Hispanic community anything. What they're doing is they're causing a civil war between the people that are here legally and have been for generations. American citizens that happen to be of Hispanic descent and those that are here illegally. You're causing a war. No one is more upset than those that have earned the right to hold their head up high and say, I'm an American citizen. We need to talk about those people first and take care of securing our border, obeying our laws, and then we're going to take care of this other community. The people in D.C. that are just throwing that out there like it's something good are doing more harm than they know to the people that are living it every day. Okay. We got a couple more minutes left. Uh, what would you like to say to the voting public out there in your district? I would love to say, please vote for me, Delinda Delgado Morgan. Also, please visit my website at Delinda Morgan for Congress and my Facebook. I need all the support, all the votes. Your votes mean more to me than anything else in this election. It's not about money. I would love your support if you had 10 or $20. But more than that, if you could ask everyone you know to vote for me. In 2012, I earned over 109,000 votes. If every single one of those people voted for me in the primary, or wrote my name in if they weren't Republicans, I would earn half the votes of my district. 418,000 votes is my entire district. That I would win the election, hands down. And please help all the candidates. Thank all the candidates for running. It's very difficult to be on the campaign trail, sometimes from 5 in the morning to 11 o'clock at night. How do you contact you? How do they contact you? They can contact me on my website or my Facebook. Facebook. They can message me on my Facebook. My email is yes at delindamorganforcongress.org. And I appreciate your time and attention. 
and I would appreciate your prayers okay. also. Okay. Well, I really appreciate uh, your time with us here. And uh, I'm, it's, 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 it, we won't be doing a no recommendation. We're saying a yes to the yes. recommendation. Okay? Thank you. Sounds good. And, and I hope the Oregonian gets that. Folks, take care. Thank you very much. We'll be back with our next second guest. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. Appreciate that. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Just tell me, tell me when. Okay, welcome back, folks. Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Again, this is Mother's Day. Again, Happy Mother's Day to everyone. As you noticed, we had we interviewed the uh, the first one, we, uh, the first mother, if you will, with, with Belinda. She's running for Congress, and now we're going to come here in the Portland metropolitan area. Another person who's running for office, actually for the city council, position number two. And I'm talking about Sharon Maxwell, and Sharon is really out there. I mean, she's knocking on doors and. And almost just like Belinda, they were they were in the construction business and and with people and this, that, and the other. This is kind of like a, a new thing for, for Sharon, but uh, she's very people-oriented, and she's learning a lot. And I, I've got to take my hat off to her for taking this opportunity to do this. Uh, we want to wish her a, a happy Mother's Day. Thank you so much, Bruce. And, and just so happens she has one, one living with you. Yes, right? my oldest granddaughter, Nylea Young, right, is Nylea. with me today. Okay, yes. good, good. So yeah, you out there knocking on the door for Say yes. Yeah, she's standing with I Grandma. Not, I knocked on Stay the door grandma. when I was at Granny Ma's and my friend. So oh, that's good. That's okay. good. That's good. Well, that's good. You, you're doing it for a good, nice person. Yes. Okay, you're, you're good. Okay. Now, what we want to do is that, again, just like we did with Belinda, we'd like to give Sharon the opportunity to, to just talk about herself and talk about herself, talk about uh, how she got and why she, what was the rationale for getting in this office uh, to run for office routine. And I think that's that's a more fair way of doing it because one thing about this business is that you really don't get the feeling of the person. 
because often the interviewers have their own their, their own selfish gains or whatever you might call it but it's all about exposure and a lot of times the folks who are doing the interview don't necessarily have the exposure of the individual they should allow the person to talk more and be a little bit more public about the person because it's very important we're we're in, we're in dire need of good solid leadership and I just happen to know that um, she she really fits that mold. It's just unfortunately, they just haven't been given the opportunity to share that with the public at large and, and with the constituency. And that's why we have Sharon on today. Besides the fact this is Mother's Day, and she's a good, solid, working mother. Trust me. Trust me. So look, Sharon, welcome. Thank you so much, Bruce. Thank had, you for having me today. We had you we had you on once before, aspect yes. of it, but as you know, we're sort of like in the fourth quarter right now. We are in the fourth and, quarter, and, we wanna, and time is running out. Right, and we want to give you the opportunity to basically, uh, you know, just basically talk about what you want to talk about today. Whatever you want to talk about, this will be your day. Sure. Well, th thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. So just a shout out to all the moms out there. Happy good. Mother's Day, the grandmothers and everyone. Um, I'm running because it's time for change at City Hall to make sure that we have an elected official who is a public servant. That's me, Sharon Maxwell. I just could not, Bruce, sit back another day, another five years, another 20 years, and allow the elected officials to practice intellectual dishonesty by not being truthful with citizens about how government should be run. When you are a public servant, you're there to represent the voice and interests of citizens. As as a private contractor doing construction projects, I'm there trying to make a profit mm -hmm. and to see how many people I can hire from the community and to, to have a successful business. But when you come to the public side, it's about the interests of citizens and making sure that we have a quality government that is going to make sure all people have a good quality of life in the city. Mm -hmm. And so at this time, I want to make sure that people know who I am. I am a mother. I am a businesswoman. I am a community builder. I am an advocate for those that have been left out and left behind. And in recognizing in 1993, when the inner North Northeast Portland, which I call my community where I was born and raised, I just seen the devastation of drugs and gangs. I didn't see any leaders, city leaders or community leaders really coming up with real strategic plans to help the people in the community. Um, after the community was totally destroyed, I said, we are better than this as people who live here. And if this situation was gonna turn around, it was gonna take the citizens that lived in that neighborhood. And that's what I did. I took action. I said, what is my part? I went into construction and became a carpenter, had my first apprenticeship at the Rose Quarter as a sprinkler fitter as well. Mm -hmm. And after I went through those programs, I recognized yes, this is what is going to help us to rebuild the community. And so I'm bringing that energy, that passion, that love of community, love of city and the people to recognize that all people have the ability to contribute if you invest in people. And so at this time, that's really what needs to happen. Um, single member districts, that's part of my platform. It allows us to elect elected officials based on districts, similar to the county. That way the city commissioner can focus on their district, have a pulse on what the priorities are, the infrastructure projects. You're more um, able to connect with citizens. Day one, I'm gonna um, every bi-monthly have town halls for the first year because I wanna be able to hear what the concerns are, what the interests are, what the ideas are. Citizens across the 95 neighborhoods, they have great ideas. They know what they want their community and city to look like. And then there's the part of the shared community value. We, you know, we've heard that Portland is one of the widest cities in the nation. And the fact that we have communities of color here, but you don't see them enjoying the success as the dominant culture. And it's time to make sure that all people have the ability to have businesses, that the young people can know that they have the ability to contribute, that they have role models, that they see their parents getting employed and having jobs, because you need that role modeling, you need that mm -hmm. mentoring from the parents in the homes. But if parents aren't having success, then if a young person who's failing out of school says, well, I don't need school, based on my parent didn't get a job. So I want to make sure that all citizens that live in the 95 neighborhoods know that the city of Portland is valuing them, helping them to, first of all, if they want to have a business, 
to be able to have access to capital. We need to come up with a plan through the single member districts where you'll be able to cre uh, create capital development bonds to help people who have business ideas so that they can start their own businesses and to help corporations hire more people. We need to get more local people working and contributing to the local economy. That's how we're going to turn this around. You know, you know, Sharon, I, you, you said a lot, and I, I, I commend you for this. And as you know, there was a point that uh, one, of the, one of our gathering, I made that point about the fact that uh, we are lacking leadership yes. within the community. Right. And, and that was one of the things that I had done when I was at the Portland Observer to put together 18. We got it, but unfortunately someone took the leaders, and we've not had leadership. Sure, and, sure. Uh, and so that's why it's so refreshing. Uh, that you are coming out the way you're Kevin Hall, and there was another and basically the same, I did all the same concept that he has along that same line. And it, it's just that um, it's going to be a tough job, though. You know, how, how, how are, you, are you educating the people? Yes, to, that's... Are they getting that's, the word? Are they getting, are they getting what you're saying? People are getting the message, but, you know, as it, um, I'm running against an incumbent, yeah, and yeah. so the dollars are out there, but because people are so tied in, that's the politics mm -hmm. of running a campaign, mm -hmm. is that a lot of the community and people that I believe would support me their programs are tied into a lot of the funding that comes from the city and the county. So it's almost like there's retribution that if they support a newcomer, someone who they really believe has the leadership and the investment, they, they kind of hold back. And I believe it's time right now to make sure, babe, can you sit up? Yeah, thank you. All right, sorry. So we want to make sure, I want to make sure that people recognize right. that my business experience, my lifelong experience of recognizing, taking on challenges as a woman that went into the construction industry, I'm one of the only right. African-American yeah. females in Oregon and Washington that has had my company as long as I've had it for 14 years and have had the success of running a million dollar business and being able to hire people both in Oregon Oregon and Washington and have great opportunities and so that's the same experience that I'm going to bring to City Hall day one and you know this week um, I declared a seven-day protest against elected officials not only but also community leaders mm -hmm. who have failed really to um, acknowledge the destruction and the devastation if when you tell me that you're giving a hundred thousand dollars to a program that's nothing when I've seen billions and millions of dollars come to the city and capital development bonds go for everything else when you have a whole community that was historically redlined and that they were uh, divested, the businesses divested, people left the, the city in droves. And so what I recognize is that when um, the neighborhoods that where the money was going into prisons, I said, this is, this is not America. This is not the democracy that I learned while I was being educated in school. And I said, as a leader, a leader is one who recognizes the opportunities in the challenge. And that's what I've been doing is recognizing hard things, addressing it. I, come, I um, founded a youth program. Uh, reaching out to gang impacted young men yeah. in the community that were really disconnected. I took the time out of my own day. I took the profits from my business. I wrote grants because when a young man committed suicide in 2008, mm -hmm. I said, I cannot sit back another day and watch young people destruct in the community. Mm -hmm. So it's really the leadership that has to step up, that has to really connect with the community and not be afraid to call out the injustice, the ills of the social justice, the civil liberties, the human rights violations that have um, taken place up under the police force that um, have people living in intimidation and fear. And then the fact that people are being labeled uh, criminals and poor when it's not their fault. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as a leader, I believe you have to come up with real solutions that address the root causes and not just the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm going to be bringing to City Hall is because that's what I've been working on for the last 21 years is being a community builder, building people who build communities that build cities. Mm -hmm. You know, well, another thing that, uh, in, in that education is a, is a major issue. Yes, it within is. Within the city, within our city. And as you note, uh, 
Uh, Portland Public Schools is one of the largest districts in the state of Oregon. Yes. And it doesn't have folk ed. And, and knowing your background and, and construction and whatever, if you don't have the training, you can't get the job. Right. How do you feel about our educational system? Well, that, that's ed? one of the other reasons that um, also triggered me into recognizing that it was time for me to run. Yeah. When I seen our number one public school system failing our children, how do you go from 77,000 students down to 44? thousand students how do you go from 14 wonderful PIL uh, high schools down to only five functioning mm -hmm. high schools where the there's three others but the population is only 500 to 550 and all of our high schools can house anywhere up to 1200 to 2200 students mm -hmm. we have to make sure as a state as a city, a local jurisdiction, that we make children a priority. Children are our future. They are the next generation. And unless we're making the investment in them to make sure that they have a 21st century world-class education to be able to compete in this new technology uh, services industry and tapping into the ingenuity and the creativity of people. That's where I feel it's almost like we've forgotten who we are as Americans. As Americans, we are one of the richest nations in the world. Mm -hmm. And for us to be able to not help to invest in people and the ideas, that's why people want to come to America. That's why people want to live in cities where they see success happening, but that's not gonna happen unless we make sure we have the, um, the funding that we need for our school system so that there is a balance in what children are receiving, you know, even with this common core and this testing. Mm -hmm. How do we get so far, we go from one extreme mm -hmm. to the other, and we just need to get back to basics. And we need to make sure at the state level, I will, as a city commissioner, I will advocate and strongly work to influence to make sure that we get the proper funding to make sure that our schools in Portland have the funding that they need. Okay. You know, let, let's get down to some, maybe some of the other little specifics that's going on right now. The sure, water sure. Piece, yes. Water. You want any comments on that? Thing? Well, I want to make it clear to the citizens of the 95 neighborhoods. Um, on yesterday, as a part of my seven-day protest, I was given some information from my campaign um, in regards to the People's Trust, which is the other initiative outside of this 26156 that that initiative was going to be on the November's ballot. But my... Uh, my um, position on the 26156 is that I am in support of that uh, yes vote on that based on the fact that the petitioners brought to light the abuses of the spending of taxpayers' money, which should have not never happened. We need oversight. We need to restore trust and transparency. And I know there's a lot of propaganda, a lot of statements out there, but I support fully the 26156. We need to send a clear message to City Hall that you cannot take the people's money and spend it on pet projects, inappropriate projects that are outside of the Bureau. So I'm asking all citizens to send a clear message. Vote yes. Sharon Maxwell, I support it fully, and that is my position. And for some of the new ones that some of the new ones who got that balance but don't know what 26156 is. Would you mind sharing that? Sure. With so this a public water district, basically what it would um, do is elect a new board and take away the power from city council. It would not change the bureaus, but it would provide the oversight, making sure that the budgets, the projects um, that come out of it, they would be making the decisions on them. And the language that it has right now, it needs to be tweaked, but that can all be worked out per the judge. That's why we need to vote yes to send a clear message that no longer will elect its who uh, say they represent the voice and interests of citizens go after the, the large corporations and give away the people's money to projects that are not a part of the city's essential services. Okay. Can you cite maybe another another specific in regards to what spurred off this? this so, yeah, so people? it was the fact that $126 million from the uh, Water Bureau and Bureau of Environmental Services, that money was approved to be spent by Nick Fish and Amanda Fritz 
on pet projects that were outside of the scope of the Water Bureau and the Bureau of Environmental Services. And the citizens sued the city council and Nick Fish, and that um, was presented to the judge. He has ruled on it in, in the case that, yes, they uh, misspent the money. Um, on some of it, he said that it was within their authority, but it never should have been spent in the first place. As a commissioner, I will make sure, number one, that we educate you, the citizens, on what your dollars are going to be spent for. If there is an emergency, if there is a change um, that is, there is a priority, we need to come back to you because we're asking you to pay the rates uh, for your water and your sewer. And so that's your money, your hard earned money that you've worked for. And we want to make sure that we're spending it correctly. As city commissioner, I am not going to ask for another dime in taxes or fees until we do perform audits on all of the bureaus to identify that we are effectively using the taxpayers dollars for the city services that are being uh, right now for this city. And day one, we need to see, I've already spoken with all of the 29 bureau directors. Uh, we need to do an audit to determine where the cost savings are. We're spending about 10 to $20 million on software systems that we're not using to full capacity. I've been told that uh, this SAP system, which we're paying about 2 to $3 million on every year, that's only being used 5%. So there's a lot of waste that needs to be cleared up. That money should be taken and used once we identify it for the streets systems uh, for transportation to get our streets um, worked on. But I, as city commissioner, I will not ask for another dollar until we do the audits to make sure that your dollars are being used correctly. You mentioned uh, special projects that, he, that both he and the man that might have used any. Can you maybe share that with us? Uh, th well, we know for sure it was the, the water house where they, uh, it was originally $250,000 mm -hmm. and it, inc it tripled in cost, almost a million dollars. And then there was the loo and then there was the voters um, owned election that they mm -hmm. used the money without, you know, wow. even asking permission. And then the fact that Nick Fish created a new housing bureau whereby he didn't put any checks and balances in place where he lent out, well, you could say lent or granted uh, $357 million interest-free to wealthy developers in South Waterfront and the Pearl District. That was money that should have went for low income to affordable housing all over the city. We have over 3,000 families that are showing up at the city's doors to ask for uh, housing. Why is that the case when we had $357 million to build and create affordable housing? First of all, millionaires should not be coming to the city. That's just like Wall, um, Wall Street and Main Street. You're giving the, the money that of the citizens to the bankers. Same thing Nick Fish is doing. And so right now, we need to restore trust. We need to restore oversight. We need to restore transparency. And we need the single member districts, which will allow us to have the oversight, the transparency, because then citizens will know where the budget dollars are going, where the priorities are, that it's based on infrastructure, that it's based on capital developments as it relates to growing this um, city over the next 20 to 35 years. Uh, the city is projecting right now over a million more people to move here. And so citizens citizens need to have a voice in that. That's what the, your government is about, for the people, by the people, and as an elected, I work for you. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I guess a little side note, uh, my little pet, one of my pet peeves, the seniors, the seniors in the Yes, seniors yes, in the I know yes. we've been working with the county and, this, and right. the city. But what do, you, what do you feel about that? Well, what I feel about that is that as like city... meal on wheels and things like that. Yes, yeah, we, we need... Well, that's I why... That's another issue. Yes. Th that's where, sit up baby, yeah. that's where single member districts comes in because in holding the county accountable right. for its $1.5 billion yes. that it says it has, where is all where the, is money the money going? Yes. And I believe single member districts and the city holding the county accountable yes. for those human services will allow us to really see where there's overlap, where th there's an, a better alignment, where we can work with our nonprofits and other organizations that are saying that 
they're doing this work. I've just seen over the years a lot of waste. As a mom, as a community member, I've done a lot of research to ascertain what these youth programs are for, what these senior programs are for, and a lot of the programs are 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 duplicates yeah. of e of yeah. each other but if you have single member districts then you can convene a lot of these agencies and organizations and you can ask them to focus on what they do best mm -hmm. and then we know that those dollars are being spent well efficiently and effectively to truly meet the needs of the seniors of the youth and across the city Shannon, I got to ask you this question. Sure. As you know, there's only been two African Americans that are, they were former city council person. Right. One in Charles Jordan. Yes. And one Dick Bogle. Yes. Okay. And then uh, here you are. You're a very strong person, uh, very enthusiastic kind of a person. How do you feel? Do you, do you feel a sense of of the the majority population being able to relate to some of the things? You're, you're a very strong person. You know, as I have traveled and visited and met with citizens across the 95 neighborhoods, um, I've felt the indifference. Mm -hmm. I've, I've right. um, seen the attitudes and the behavior. And, um, you know, this is the 50th year that yeah. the Civil Rights Bill was yeah. signed by uh, President Lyndon B. Johnson. Mm -hmm. And it's the 51st year after the March on Washington. And that's why I'm really pushing a shared community value. Mm -hmm. As I looked um, through this um, at this time, and I'm speaking to citizens across these 95 neighborhoods, it's time to acknowledge each other's humanity. It's time to say, hello, neighbor, how are you? Hello, friend, how's it going with you? That's the type of climate change, culture change, mm -hmm. that as city commissioner, I want to bring to the city of Portland and to this region and to our partnering cities because it's probably been only 10 or 15 years that African Americans really have even felt comfortable moving out of the city of Portland mm -hmm. and out of Northeast Portland. So we, we, we've done a lot of work but we have a lot of work still to do but I believe um, that if people would just acknowledge one another's humanity and recognize that we all have the same interest and that is to have life liberty and the pursuit of happiness and that there's more than enough for us all to participate and be successful in this life. And as city commissioner, that's what I'm going to focus on, is making sure that all people matter, that all people have the ability to contribute, and that when we invest in human capital, as, as I say it, that means people, investing in people, making sure our young people get a good education, that parents get jobs so that they can role model and present to their children a life of success, no matter who you are, where you are, and what neighborhood you live in, it's time for a shared community value at City Hall. You did well, and good luck to you. Sir. Thank you so good very time. much for having me. Thank you. All right. Again, this is Bruce Burchard again. Hey, I'll see you next week. Have a good one, and again, happy Mother's Day to everyone, okay? Happy Mother's Day.